It is 15 August 2021. I'm Charlie Garrett, and this is the CG Report. Florida, a haven for the Jews. That and a lot of other things to go over on today's report. Okay, let's see here. We're getting started today with a visitor. Just walked in just a second ago. We got Robert from Fort Worth, and he's actually here doing, as he says, reconnaissance. He's looking for a home in Florida, and he says he may have found one in Sarasota. So that would be great, and we welcome you. And uh, apparently, I asked him, how did he know about the church? He said he's been watching online for a while. He first started watching JD out in Hawaii, and uh, uh, John Holler up in Columbus, and also the Superior Word. So there you go. It's a got a wonderful gentleman with a great smile here, and it's a pleasure having you. All right, let's see here. We have um, uh, Wednesday. I did another CG report. If you did not watch that, I'm just letting you know because I don't know if you get notifications. It's on both Rumble and on YouTube. Uh, I would hope that you would watch it. It's kind of informative. And uh, I, I do not want to commit to doing this every week, but if I can find the time. Uh, two weeks ago, it rained very hard. I couldn't do my morning job, and so I had a couple hours to burn. And then this past Wednesday, all I did was stand on the roof of the mall I take care of and watch some people install an air conditioner. And I was able to put some things together uh, while I was watching them. So uh, I don't want to commit to doing this every week, but when I have the free time, I will try to do a Wednesday report as well. So please go watch that. And then uh, secondly... I got a uh, article from WND. Uh, I just want to bring up uh, the title for you, U.S. House Candidate. We should be allowed to shoot anyone who doesn't take COVID seriously enough. So there you go. He's uh, independent, but he is obviously a lefty, and he's allowed to say things like that, whereas if we said anything even close to that, we would be deplatformed immediately. And then another article from WND. Welcome to 1938. First, they came for the unvaccinated. And so he's talking about the progression of how things happened in Nazi Germany. I would like to remind people that have read that article or that do read that article is that there is a difference between Nazi Germany and the United States. It's called the Second Amendment. They have not done what they did in all these other nations. So I'd just like you to keep that in mind is that there is a point that the government can go and no further. And that was the purpose of having a Second Amendment. So... Uh, one more article, a natural news article about concentration camps. I was sent it probably 50 times this week. I do not recommend anybody ever, ever read natural news. It is one of the worst, along with Neon Nettle, it's quite possibly the worst news service on the planet, okay? The guy will, he will uh, link articles, and then he expects nobody to check the linked articles. And what he does is he gives you a sensational title, he twists the information from the original articles to say nothing like the original, and it is just clickbait. And the reason why, what I mean by clickbait is every time somebody clicks onto his site and reads one of his articles, he gets money. And so he is there to sensationalize things. What he said about concentration camps, especially coming out of Tennessee, is completely untrue. All you need to do is click on the PDF of the executive order from the governor, and you'll see that it is completely contrary to what he says in that article. He came out with another one. Uh, it was Senate yesterday about um, kidnapping your kids. The government is going to kidnap your kids. You go to the linked article. It doesn't say anything about that. Do not read natural news. This guy claims to be a Christian, and yet everything he publishes is a lie or it's the twisting of the truth. So stay away from natural news, and we'll go on from there. Uh, starting out today with some news from Israel. From Vision Times, most COVID-19 patients, this is in Israel, at an Israel hospital, fully vaccinated. Most of them, a doctor calls the mandates diabolic. The majority of COVID-19 patients in an Israeli hospital are fully vaccinated, including those with severe disease, according to one of the hospital's doctors. He's right there, and he can testify to this. His name is Dr. Kobe Haviv, medical director of Herzog Hospital in Jerusalem. He said in a Channel 13 TV news interview, I'm citing all this. Normally, I'll take that kind of information and not tell you about it, but I don't want to be deplatformed for saying something without citing a source. So there you go with that. 95% of the severe patients 
are vaccinated. The ones that are in the worst shape in Israel are vaccinated. Furthermore, 85 to 90 percent of the hospitalizations are in fully vaccinated people, and the hospital is opening more and more COVID wards. Once again, this is an interview on Channel 13 TV in Israel. Okay, the influx of vaccinated patients has led him to conclude that the effectiveness of the vaccine is waning or fading out. The hospital's website states that the center is Israel's foremost center for geriatric, respiratory, mental health, and psychotrauma care, treatment, and research. With 330 beds, Herzog Hospital is the third largest hospital in Jerusalem. Of the 72 hospitalized COVID-19 patients, 25 patients were in critical condition, 38 were in moderate condition, and nine were in mild condition. There were two deaths reported at the time of the interview. According to data from the Israeli Ministry of Health released on July 22nd, the effectiveness of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine at preventing COVID-19 has plummeted from 90% to 39%, coinciding with the spread of the Delta variant in the country. I'm not making a comment on that. I'm reading the article. That's all I'm doing is giving you information from a doctor in Israel. I'll keep saying this because when you say things like this, you're bound to get deplatformed because you're making a statement. I'm not making a statement. I'm reading articles from the Times of Israel. 14 Israelis who got the third shot later infected with COVID-19. So even the booster shots, they're getting it with the booster shot. 14 Israelis have been diagnosed with COVID-19 despite having been inoculated with a third COVID-19 vaccine dose, according to health ministry data. According to the network, two of those infected after receiving the booster shot have been hospitalized. Such sporadic instances would not be enough for medical officials to draw conclusions as to the third dose's general effectiveness in fighting off the Delta variant of the disease. Listen to this. 11 of the 14 cases were over the age of 60 and the remaining three were immunocompromised individuals under 60. So it's attacking the people that it is always attacked. Okay, the network said the two that were hospitalized were over 60. Some 420,000 Israelis have been administered a third booster shot so far in a drive that began last week, which is a week and a half ago now. From all Israel, COVID-19, no shaking hands, no hugs, no kissing. Corona cabinet makes sweeping recommendations. Israel has passed a new set of more stringent restrictions that will go into effect, including the reintroduction of masks in large outdoor gatherings, limiting travel for Israelis, expanding quarantine requirements, and increasing the scope of the green passport, all in an effort to curb the rise of COVID infections. The cabinet called on the public to get vaccinated and to follow directives, which include refraining from physical greetings. The public is called on to understand the situation and to therefore stop shaking hands, embracing and kissing, and to avoid non-essential gatherings in closed spaces. We've got a couple people in the congregation right now that are home. They're sick. Okay. Do you know why they're home? Because they're sick. Okay. And that is what you normally do. And if you see somebody sick that's coughing or, or whatever, you don't go up and give them a hug. You don't give them a kiss, right? This is obvious. But you don't take that to the extreme of the entire public because nobody would ever have children again, I suppose. So let's be reasonable and don't let's ignore. Yeah, don't talk to your neighbors. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, yeah, let's be reasonable. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, as long as I'm married to this woman, she's going to get hugs and kisses whenever I want it or whenever she wants it. Sometimes I get a palm in the face, but <laughs> not really. Okay, from CNN. Israelis told to stop embracing elderly urged to get booster as COVID-19 cases spike. So there you go with that. Gateway Pundit, 12 of 13 most vaccinated countries in the world. 12 of the 13 most vaccinated countries in the world are now listed by CDC as travel risks. Yeah, Wall Street Journal. Why Orthodox Jews are leaving Brooklyn for Florida. What would motivate a Hasidic rabbi and his followers to leave a Brooklyn enclave where they've lived for generations and establish a quickly growing community in Wyomama, Florida, a semi-rural area near Tampa Bay? The same reasons that have led to an unprecedented wave of Orthodox Jewish families moving to South Florida. 
education choice, low taxes, and good governance. Most Orthodox families send their children to private Jewish schools because public school is simply not an option. Religious instruction is as important to them as academics, but the tuition burden can be immense. That's why many young families up north are enticed by Florida's robust menu of state-supported private school scholarships worth on an average of about $7,500 a year, as well as expanded benefits for children with a wide range of disabilities. These programs make private tuition far more affordable in Florida than in New York and New Jersey. Also because we have Republicans normally in power in the state of Florida. That's why we have these things. Did you know that we, we do not need to do a constitutional amendment to say no state taxes, income taxes? Do you know why? Because we already have a state constitutional amendment that says no state income taxes. You know why they did that? They did that because they know that all of the lefties are going to move down here eventually and they're going to want to do that. If you want to get away from all those high taxes and all those crazy laws about giving your money to a government that's just going to squander it, come to Florida. If you vote Democrat, don't come. Don't okay? Come These programs make private school tuition far more affordable in Florida than in New York and New Jersey. Legislation recently signed by Governor DeSantis has made even more families eligible for these options, further fueling the migration. Jews started moving south even before the pandemic. Figures from Florida's Education Department show enrollment in Jewish day schools statewide grew in 2020 to 12,482 students from 10,623 in 2018. The number of such schools grew to 64 from 50 during that time. The pandemic supercharged demand for Jewish day schools in South Florida. So there you go. I have no problem with them coming here. They're productive members of the society and they do their own thing. They're like the Chinese. They get into their own little enclaves and they kind of live together. That's fine. I have no problem with that. The hardest working group of people I ever have seen in my life, and I've been all over the world, are the Chinese. I'm telling you, I lived in the Chinese section of Pataling Jaya, Malaysia. You know where that is. And they would outwork all of the people in the country by a factor of about a thousand. Okay. They're very industrious people. They work very hard. And uh, the Jews are, you know, they're dedicated to what they do. They have a different outlook on life, especially when they're the Hasidim. But uh, I have no problem with them moving down here and having their own little enclaves and doing their own thing. They will be productive members of the society. Then I especially feel this way after watching the um, elections this last year in New York where the Hasidic Jews by the bucketful, had up Trump signs. And I said, these are people we want in Florida. There you go. Okay, now some news concerning the state of Christianity today. Glosen Tay, I hope I pronounced his name right. Glosen Tay finished both Leviticus and Esther. Robert Belvin has finished Exodus once, but is going back over it again. And she says she's also finished Ruth. And then Jerry Jeffer has completed Genesis, Ruth, and Exodus. And he said, and I, I feel bad repeating this because I hate to make people cry, but he says, every time you wept, I did too. I got a little sidetracked toward the end of Exodus, the enemy trying to divert me from learning, back on track and moving on following God's superior word. So I'm sorry when I, I break down during my sermons. I try to preach that out of myself during the week, but sometimes I cannot help it. And I know that makes other people cry. So... There you go. But it, it's a good thing. it is a good thing. Jesus and holding fast to him is an emotional issue. And if you lose that, you've lost something very precious and tender. So, all right. From the Christian Post, Hindu leader issues call for anti-Christian violence. Let us drag people from the church. Right in India, these people are really suffering. Weeks after all, police stations in a district in eastern India were ordered to keep surveillance on Christians and report on any conversion activities. Hindu nationalist leaders held an anti-Christian rally there, advocating for violence against the Christian community. The rally, attended by less than 500 people, good, including prominent leaders of the Hindu nationalist, I can't pronounce party was held in the Bastar district of some other place I can't pronounce. Let us drag people from the church and stop conversions at any cost, Amit Sahu, president of the state union of BJP, told the crowd, challenging them to make the Bastar region a conversion-free zone. 
We will frighten Christians who are involved in conversion work in the region. Rup Singh Mandavi, another state BJP leader, told the gathering. We will not allow the missionary work to be carried on in Bastar and will protect the Hindu religion by stopping the conversions. Although it attracted a thinner crowd than had been portrayed prior to it, the rally has spread fear among local Christians. Though the rally was not successful in terms of numbers, the Hindu nationalist activists will be more aggressive. It is their plan to do reconversion programs. The good thing about Jesus is if you have come to Christ, you are in Christ. You cannot be reconverted out of there, okay? You may be in the worldly, fleshly body reconverted out, but you are eternally saved. If you don't believe in eternal salvation, you need to rethink your theology because you are wrong, okay? So, especially in the villages and interior places. We won't know about these incidents of persecution because of the remoteness of these areas. Only God can save his people, they say. So we want to pray for the people in India who are facing this. And, uh, you know, it's very sad. They can openly say these things in a country like that, whereas a Christian can't go out and do pretty much anything without some type of persecution. So there you go. From the Epic Times, Seattle Mission asked Supreme Court to uphold right to higher co-religionists. This is an important thing that's going on. A Christian mission in Seattle is appealing to the Supreme Court of the United States after the Washington Supreme Court ruled it did not have the right to refuse to hire someone who disagrees with its beliefs. Now, this is a problem. These people get themselves into what's called 501c3. Okay, the government has got this umbrella over you, and they can monitor what you're doing. And if the government under the SCOTUS says that they must hire somebody that agrees with their beliefs, that's going to be a precedent for all 501c3s forever. Okay, so we will hope that this does not happen. But keep this in mind is that, uh, you know, you want to not be a part of that type of an organization, if at all possible, in the future. If you're looking for a church somewhere, try to find one that is not, because otherwise you may be compromised the next time they hire somebody. All right, just a warning to you. All right, it says um, uh, churches and religious organizations have the First Amendment right to hire those who share their beliefs without being punished by the government, said John Birch, senior counsel and vice president of appellate advocacy with the ADF. Courts have consistently recognized that a religious organization's purpose will be undermined if the government forces it to hire those who do not subscribe to the group's beliefs. Seattle's Union Gospel Mission is a nonprofit, unfortunately, there you go, this is the problem, that exists to preach the Christian gospel. Its employees must share and live out the mission's beliefs by meeting the needs of the homeless and evangelizing to them, according to the group's petition filed with the Supreme Court. One of the mission's ministries is Open Door Legal Services, a legal clinic that assists those in the mission's recovery programs and other valuable community members. The respondent, Matthew S. Woods, applied for an open door position with the stated intent of changing the mission's religious beliefs and without satisfying the prerequisites of regular church attendance, a pastor's recommendation, and an explanation of his relationship with Jesus, something all required but the Washington Supreme Court said, that doesn't matter. You have to hire this dolt. The mission describes itself in the petition as a nonprofit ministry that loves and cares for its homeless neighbors throughout greater Seattle. From a borrowed soup kettle used to care for those suffering from the Great Depression in 1932, the mission has grown to serve and love over a thousand homeless individuals each day. The mission is about going far more than providing for material needs. Its primary purpose is to bring the love of Jesus Christ and hope for a new life to those who most need it. The mission seeks nothing less than to see every homeless neighbor loved, redeemed, and restored by meeting urgent physical needs while building relationships and offering faith. This approach is spectacularly successful. Two years after program completion, 70% of mission clients are working or going to school full-time. This will all be ruined immediately if this person is hired, immediately. The mission understands that success to be rooted in its evangelism, a success that would quickly end if employees undermine the organization's religious convictions, which is exactly what they want. That's exactly what they want. Destroy Christianity from the inside. They've been doing it in churches for years. 
They're doing it to missions groups now. Some news from the Mideast and Africa today. From the Times of Israel. In Israel, top Bahrain diplomat says Iran nuke deal fueled violence and chaos. These are Arabs that are saying that the only thing that that JCPOA that Obama pushed through did was to fuel violence and chaos. Visiting Israel, a senior Bahraini diplomat blasted the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, saying that it had fueled violence and unrest across the region and caused the death of innocents. What did it leave us with? Sheikh Khalifa Bahrain's Undersecretary for International Relations said of the accord at a press briefing at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. More crisis and more chaos in the region. Khalifa said Bahrain had hoped the accord, known officially as the JCPOA, would open up a new page for Iran and the region. But, on the contrary, it has fueled crises across the Middle East. It has increased the number of refugees that have fled into Europe. It has caused more instigation of extremism and hatred in many different regions across the Middle East. What we see is, speaking from a Bahraini perspective and the experience of my country with Iran, is continuous interference in domestic affairs in my country, he continued. Support of extremism and terrorism, continuous smuggling of arms and explosives and drugs and narcotics. Khalifa added that the JCPOA has caused the death of tens of security forces and innocent civilians and thousands of injured security personnel. What result did we get out of the JCPOA? Remind me, he said. Was there any good result that came out of it? I do not think so. For us, we have not seen it. And yet, our current administration is trying to push this through still. Times of Israel. Blinken vows no impunity for Iran over deadly attack on Israel-linked tanker. How long ago was that? Two weeks? Nothing has been done. They're just twiddling their thumbs up in Washington. Secretary of State Blinken renewed vows to punish Iran for allegedly attacking an Israeli-linked tanker, saying the world cannot allow impunity. Speaking to a virtual Security Council session on maritime security, Blinken said the explosions in late July on the MT Mercer Street were part of a pattern of attacks and other provocative behavior. It is on all of our nations to hold accountable those responsible which means Iran. That's what it means. Hold them accountable, but they will not do it. Failing to do so will only fuel their sense of impunity and embolden others inclined to disregard the maritime order, he said. Two crew members from Britain and Romania died in the blasts. I bet they're not happy about this at all, which the U.S. military said were caused by drones built by Iran from the Daily Wire. Lebanese economy, this is really important. Keep your eye on Lebanon in the next 10 to 15 days. Lebanese economy collapsing amid hyperinflation, power outages. Amid hyperinflation and inconsistent power supplies following a massive explosion in Beirut last year, one year ago, Lebanon may be witnessing one of the worst three economic depressions since the 19th century, according to the World Bank. Lebanon's GDP plummeted from close to U.S. $55 billion in 2018 to an estimated U.S. $33 billion in 2020, with U.S. GDP capita failing by around 40%. Such a brutal and rapid contraction is usually associated with conflicts or wars. This illustrates the magnitude of the economic depression that the country is enduring, with sadly no clear turning point on the horizon, given the disastrous deliberate policy in action. The social impact of the crisis, which is already dire, could rapidly become catastrophic. More than half of the population is likely below the national poverty line. Lebanon, with a history of civil war and conflicts, faces realistic threats to its already fragile social peace. If this affects Lebanon, it's going to affect Israel in some way or another. Power outages have become so frequent that restaurants time their hours to schedule of electricity from private generators. Bras have erupted in supermarkets as shoppers rush to buy bread, sugar, and cooking oil before they run out, or hyperinflation topping 400% for foods puts the prices out of reach. Medical professionals have fled just as a pandemic hammers the country with a new wave of infection. 
What that means is that the trained people, the medical professionals, the doctors all bailed out and they don't have anybody to take care of their medical needs now. Thefts are up 62% and murder rates are rising fast. Keep your eyes on Lebanon in the next couple weeks. As we span the globe, we try to never miss something interesting from Mongolia. From PV Mag, Mongolia launches EPC tender for 10 megawatt solar park. Mongolia's Ministry of Energy has issued a tender to seek EPC contractors for the construction of a 10 megawatt solar park. The Moron, yes, it's called the Moron Solar <laughs> PV project, is part of the upscaling renewable energy sector project, which is being co-managed by the government of Mongolia and the Asian Development Bank. The goal is to deploy 40.5 megawatts of solar and wind capacity in the country's western and Altai Ula Stai regions. So they have a moron power plant being built. The Book of Daniel prophesied that technology would increase in the end times. What's up in that regard? I'm looking at my pretty wife and she's looking at me with a blank stare. She wants to know what's going on with technology. From Texplorer, Metaverse. The next internet revolution. Imagine a world where you could sit on the same couch as a friend who lives thousands of miles away or conjure up a virtual version of your workplace while at the beach. Welcome to the metaverse, a vision of the future that sounds fantastical, but which tech titans like Facebook founder Dink Zuckerberg are betting on as the next great leap in the evolution of the internet. The term was coined by Neil Stephenson in his 1992 novel, Snow Crash, in which people don virtual reality headsets to interact inside a game like Digital World. Can anybody tell me another movie that had the same theme? Matrix? Well, The Matrix, that was later. I'm thinking of my time in high school. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not, well, Schwarzenegger did too. We got some, that's right. The one I'm thinking of, uh, Lawnmower Man. Anybody ever watch Lawnmower Man? No? no? Oh, that was a great movie. Okay, well, that's what I was thinking. You're all correct. Good answers to all of you. But Lawnmower Man was really, it was spooky to me. I was a kid when I saw that, and I was scared. Okay, Lawnmower Man. Okay, so Snow Crash is the book that it was based on. The book has long been enjoyed with cult status among Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. But in recent months, the metaverse has become one of the tech sector's hottest buzzwords with the companies pouring millions of dollars into its development. Facebook fueled the excitement further by announcing the creation of a new team to work on Zuckerberg's vision of the metaverse. This is going to be a really big part of the next chapter for the technology industry. Over the next five years, he predicted Facebook would transition from primarily being a social media company to being a metaverse company. As with many tech buzzwords, the definition of the metaverse depends on whom you ask. But broadly, it involves blending the physical world with the digital one. With the help of augmented reality glasses, it might allow you to see information whiz before your eyes as you walk around a city, from traffic and pollution updates to local history. But metaverse enthusiasts are dreaming of a future in which the idea could be extended much further, allowing us to be transported to digital settings that feel real, such as a nightclub or a mountaintop. As workers have grown weary of video conferences during the pandemic, Zuckerberg is especially excited about the idea that co-workers could be brought together in virtual rooms that feel like they are face to face. Games in which players enter immerse Digital worlds offer a glimpse into what the metaverse could eventually look like, blurring virtual entertainment with the real world economy. I can tell you this right now, that does not interest Charlie Garrett this much, okay? I don't want anything on my head where sensory information is being dumped into me, okay? I, that doesn't interest me. Now, one of my very good friends has a new drone where he wears goggles and he actually is participating in the drone and that's so he can make much quicker responses with his filming with his drone. That I might be willing to entertain, but nothing that has anything external that could be piped into me. I, I would never want that, okay? Oh, well, who would use that for evil? Yeah, who would use that for evil? That's a good question. Why don't you do a report on that for me and I'll make it into a Wednesday CG report. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, let's see here. It's a dangerous world, including the inevitable plagues of the book of Revelation, which it prophesies of. Let's see how that's developing. From Reuters, protesters in France denounce COVID health pass rules for a fourth weekend. They're probably doing it right now for a fifth. From Fox, thousands of protesters packed Paris streets in defiance of COVID-19 vaccine passport. Our freedoms are dying, they say. From IMGUR, Italy vaccinated burn their vaccine passports, their green pass in solidarity with the unvaccinated. Good choice there. Zero Hedge. Okay, I've got to give my usual disclaimer. Everything that I'm going to say now is off of an article. I'm not here to uh, speak about the efficacy or not efficacy of vaccines myself. I'm not here to tell you not to get them or to get them, okay? I'm just saying that so that you uh, uh, know that I am trying to not get deplatformed for reading an article. Zero Hedge. Did the CDC director just accidentally admit that vaccination passports are futile? The director of the CDC made an important admission during an interview on CNN. Rochelle Walensky stated the vaccine does not prevent COVID-19 infection, nor does it stop the vaccinated person from transmitting the infection or the Delta variant. According to Walensky, the only benefit from the vaccine now is presumably that it reduces the severity of the symptoms. If a vaccinated and non-vaccinated person have the same capacity to carry, shed, and transmit the virus with or without symptoms, then what difference does a vaccination passport or vaccination ID make? According to the CDC today, both the vaxxed and the non-vaxxed person walking into a restaurant, store, group, venue, or workplace present the exact same risk to the other people there. So how does the presentation of proof of vaccine make any difference? Now, this is based on her comments during an interview on CNN. Okay, so it goes on. Additionally, her entire statement makes no sense, which doesn't surprise me being a lefty. There is no evidence that vaccinated asymptomatic carriers are asymptomatic because of the vaccine. There are likely just as many asymptomatic non-vaccinated carriers. The data shows an equally distributed infection rate regardless of vaccination rate, which is simultaneously admitted by Walensky, which, as an outcome, is an admission that undercuts the entire argument for compulsory vaccines. The reverse is also evident in the data. There are just as many vaxxed carriers who are symptomatic, meaning sick, as there are unvaxxed carriers who are symptomatic, meaning sick. Or if you're in Israel, it's actually many more that are vaccinated because we read that article from a doctor in the hospital in Jerusalem 10 minutes ago. The percentage of vaxxed and non-vaxxed people hospitalized is identical to the vaxxed, non-vaxxed population around the hospital. In regional populations with extremely high vaccination rates, the COVID infection rate continues unabated. The percentage of vaccinated people hospitalized is identical to the percentage of people vaccinated in the community. In Gibraltar, 99% of the population is vaccinated. COVID infection rates are climbing. In Iceland, over 75% of the population is vaccinated. Infection rates are climbing. Singapore and Israel show the same thing, and they give the data sets, okay? They provide them on the article. So what is the vaccination passport for? Okay, there you go. That's that's it. I'm not making any comment of my own on this. I'm just reading it to you, but I will say this. I'm giving this information and eventually somebody's going to say, we don't like what this guy is saying and we're going to deplatform it. Go to Rumble. We're on Rumble as well. Okay, there you go. And Sermon Audio. We're on Sermon Audio. So everything is there. I, it's just going to happen even with me telling you that I'm just reading an article that makes sense because the left doesn't make any sense. Okay, from Defender. V-A-E-R-S. This is the information center that the CDC uses to tell you their information. VAERS latest data include two new reports of teen deaths following COVID vaccine as total reports of deaths exceed 12,000 now. VAERS, remember now with the flu, what was it in the 70s? I reported on this about a month and a half ago. There were 250 cases of, you know, debilitating uh, re results from getting the vaccine and there were 50 deaths that was it about 300 people affected in one way or another and they pulled it they said we cannot allow this into the society what about the numbers i just read okay let's go on 
VAERS data released by the CDC show a total of 545,000 338 reports of adverse events from all age groups following COVID vaccines, including 12,366 deaths and 70,105 serious injuries. Get this, between December 14th and July 30th for six months. That's the number, 545,000. Some of the people have lost limbs. Remember the lady that lost both her legs last week and now they're amputating her arms. We've got people that have had all the skin peel off their bodies. These are all valid reports. They are all reported. That's not making anything up. And yet these are continuing to be safe and effective. Safe and effective. And, and I've got... It's underreported. I have got this... Oh, you know what? We've got... Uh, at least one person here and m several family members in this church right now that were tested just two months ago yes. for COVID-19. And they were shown to be positive. And yet this past week, the mark is still on this individual's arm, so you can go verify that this is true. They were tested for, what is the term? Um, Antibody. Antibodies. And they had... Zero. What does that tell you? They, didn't have COVID. they never had COVID at all. Okay, and that's that's right in this church. These are people that were told they were positive. They had to lock down. They had to give up their lives. They had to cancel things. They couldn't go here. They couldn't do that and this and that and one thing and another. And now they have zero antibodies in their body, meaning they never had it. Okay, so this is just making you aware of things. I'm not making any statement about the efficacy of vaccines here. I'm not making any statement about the nastiness of coronavirus. I'm just giving you facts. You can go look at the pin mark in the arm to see that that person was just checked and there are no antibodies, which means they never had COVID-19. Okay, from the CDC, 2009-10, swine flu killed five times as many children as COVID. I've got the uh, graph if you want to see that. Weasel zippers, nurse injects 8,600 people with saline, not COVID vaccine. Saving people one vaccine at a time. Yes. Okay, speaking of nurses, I have a nurse that I need to come up here, please, and make it quick because, and you too, I need you to be with this nurse. Come up here. The lady sitting right back there, come up here. I, my mother. She's obviously, she's obviously just, who are you pointing at? I mean, my finger's only in one direction. Okay, I need to see that both of you are in this. Okay. Um, this is my mother. You've seen her before. She has a son that she has three sons. One of them is having a birthday soon. And so I wanted to wish her a happy Mother's Day. And at the same time, my wife came home with a box yesterday and she said, this is my, um, what do you call it? My present for having served 25 years as a nurse. So Ooh. there you go. I want to congratulate both of these women. And when you leave... When you leave at the end of church, there's a bouquet of flowers for you. You pick the one you want first because she's got other flowers as well. And then uh, there's one for you also. So congratulations to these two beautiful women. I need a kiss on my cheek. Really? Um, she's very shy. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. Where were we? Uh, yes. Nurses. Saving people's lives. Vaccines. Um, saline solution, etc. Epic Times, Australia's capital territory goes into snap, seven-day lockdown after one COVID case. One COVID case, and they shut down the entire area. Okay, the state of morality is declining. Here's some news on that. From Georgia Star News, Governor Abbott asks Department of Family Protective Services to say whether trans surgeries for kids are child abuse. Well, I thought I'll report on that, and I had the whole article to read to you. I didn't even have to wait until the end of the week. So I just give you the title of that one, and here we have Epic Times. Gender reassignment surgery is child abuse, says Texas Commissioner. Abbott announced he received a letter from the state's DFPS determining that genital mutilation of a child through gender transitioning surgery constitutes child abuse. You think so? Abbott had directed DFPS to issue a determination on the matter last week, and the department's commissioner, Jamie Masters, replied with his findings. Genital mutilation of a child through reassignment surgery is child abuse, Masters wrote. 
The surgical procedure physically alters a child's genitalia for non-medical purposes, yes. potentially inflicting irreversible harm to children's bodies. Child abuse. Some other news from around the world. And please be sure to check out the Superior Word sermons. I know that you will be blessed by them. If you've ever read in the book of Genesis a story and you say, I wonder what that story is in there for. Why is this even in there? You'll find out. Okay, everything points to Jesus in the book of Genesis. I'm going to give you an example just because it popped into my head and we're a couple minutes ahead of time. The story of Lot and his two daughters. Anybody ever wonder why that's in there? Okay, these two daughters are in a cave with their father and they say, hey, I'm going to sleep with my father tonight and have a baby through my father. And then the other daughter, the older daughter says, I slept with my father last night and I want you to do it tonight. Okay, why is that story in there? Have you ever wondered? It's incredible why. And it's not what you've heard in all these sermons over the past years where, oh, it's an immoral occasion and blah, 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 has nothing to do with that. Watch the sermon and you will find out why and how it points to Jesus Christ, okay? From the Epic Times, wild public school exodus in Indiana. Thousands of students are leaving public schools for private schools or homeschooling in Yay. Indiana, according Yay. to Tony Clinton. Yes, a curriculum developer, educator, and education policy journalist from Indianapolis, Indiana. The reason why we're getting so much noise over here is because we have an educator sitting right over there. Okay. What is happening in the schools across our nation is disgraceful. Amen. It is disgraceful, and people have had enough of it. I do not recommend one person send their children to public school. Amen. Years ago, I was in the third world country. It's, it's a little further advanced now. I'm sure this person here could tell me that. I haven't been there in 25 years. But when I was there, it was back in the jungle for the most part, in Malaysia. And our children went to kindergarten. And in kindergarten, they had to learn three languages, Bahasa Malay, Chinese because it was Tadika U-E, which was a Chinese uh, school, and then they had to know English. And they had to know their pluses and minuses and division and subtraction and all that kind of stuff wow. in kindergarten. Oh, yeah. They came back here and they went to Philippi Shores Elementary School and they said, here's some crayons for you in first grade. And we pulled them out and we paid, we sacrificed all we could to keep them in a private Christian school yeah, and I recommend anybody to do that. Your children are worth a lot more than what they're getting in these schools. And here's another thing I've heard at least a hundred times in the past two years. My son, my daughter went off to college and they have turned lefty. Yes. They have walked away from Jesus. I do not recommend anybody send their child to a public college anywhere. If you don't send them to a Christian college, don't send them to college. They'll do better off anyway. Okay. So having said that, we'll go on. Kinnett said there that normally there's a common fluctuation of 5 to 10 in enrollment in many smaller Christian schools. But this year, the numbers are up by hundreds per school, smart people in many cases. And one case in Greenwood, the school has jumped almost double the number of students in attendance. I'm going to stop right there because this came to mind and it has nothing to do with this, but I just want to tell you how proud I am of this person. My wife came back from Malaysia with her two children and me, obviously, but she didn't leave me there. But she said, I want to be a nurse. Okay. And she's, you know, already older. I mean, I'm not saying any age. I'm just saying she's, she's got career behind her and all kinds of stuff. And she says, I want to be a nurse. And so she, and I'm not kidding when I say this, this is no exaggeration. She would get up way early, about 5.30 or so every single day. And she would study for her nursing exam. Now, this is her second language, and nursing stuff is technical. It's not something you just learn when you're speaking to people in normal language. So she would get up very early. Then she would take our children to that Christian school. Then she would go to the school, and then she would come home, and I never one time did not have a dinner ready. She always cooked dinner, and she would stay up every single day until 12 o'clock studying. I, I said six, it's three o'clock. She would go from three o'clock in the morning until 12 o'clock at night for two years. She did this yeah. without failing, without ever missing a dinner for me. So I want you to know, I've got the best wife in the world. You might think you do, but I'm sorry. I have the best wife in the world. Every day, three o'clock until 12 o'clock for two full years. Anyway, 
And in one case in Greenwood, the school has jumped almost double the number of students in attendance. The Suburban Christian School in Greenwood recorded 320 students last year and has so far already registered 551 students for the coming year. Kennett obtained enrollment data from 319 private schools in Indiana, 154 of which have seen an enrollment leap of at least 30 students from last school year. 49 schools saw enrollment numbers increase by at least 150% from the previous year. Some schools have to place new student candidates on wait lists as the maximum capacities have been exceeded. The re that's a good problem to have, folks. The reason for the exodus is a multiplicity of factors. Parents are really upset with that huge number of things going on in our public schools. They're upset with the quarantine that caused a huge learning gap in schools in the last year and a half. They're aggravated with CRT, social emotional learning. They're aggravated with children being required to wear masks regardless of vaccination status. All of these small issues have piled up and really put so much pressure that it seems this dam is bursting. And it's a great dam to burst. Amen. Epic Times. Florida approves private school vouchers for families unhappy with COVID-19 mask mandates. Good job, Governor DeSantis. Florida's Board of Education approved private school vouchers. I wish that was when we were there because we had to pay right out of our pocket, but I would have taken the government money for that. Anyway, because we're still paying our property taxes. We never stop paying that. We're paying for the public schools and all those kids that are going through that crummy education while trying to afford to keep them in that Christian school working all we could. I worked, she knows, I worked seven days a week from before dark until after dark for years to keep them in that school. Okay, so this is what you do when you love your children. Please do it. Don't let them get used up by these public educators. Parents in the state now are allowed to access vouchers for private schools if they believe pandemic related rules are a health or educational danger to their child. They could request vouchers under provisions that are generally used to protect children who believe they're being bullied. COVID-19 harassment means any threatening, discriminatory, insulting, or dehumanizing verbal, written, or physical conduct an individual student suffers in relation to or as a result of school district protocols for COVID-19, including masking requirements, the separation or isolation of students, or COVID-19 testing requirements that have had the effect of substantially interfering with the student's educational performance. What a great thing they have done. Board member Ben Gibson said that if a school district doesn't comply, the Board of Education could hold up the transfer of state money. We're not going to hurt kids. We're not going to pull money that's going to hurt kids in any way. If a parent wants their child to wear a mask at school, they should have that right. If a parent doesn't want their child to wear a mask at school, they should have that right. Amen. Florida state officials have been at odds with federal authorities over masking amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, coming after the CDC recommended that all children, regardless of whether they've been vaccinated or not, should wear masks. Governor DeSantis issued an executive order stipulating that parents are the ones who should decide whether their children need to wear masks in schools. It's a parent's responsibility. School boards who refuse to comply with DeSantis's order would face a loss of funding from the state. Yay, that's awesome. Zero hedge. DeSantis threatens to withhold salaries from school officials who defy mask mandate ban. Okay, unfortunately, a couple days later, Biden came out and said, we'll go around you and we will fund you directly from the federal government and we'll skip DeSantis. So DeSantis said, all right, I've done my job. I can't do any more. Right. Zero Hedge, Ron DeSantis is defending freedom by getting in the way of COVID authoritarians. That's why we love our governor. Amen. We love our gov. From JTN. More than one, I had over the past week, I don't like talking on the phone. It is the thing, I was telling this to Claudia this morning, I hate talking on the phone more than anything in the world. But when people call, I do talk to them. It, the reason why I don't like it is because I'm always busy and I can multitask doing anything else but talking on the phone. But I've had several people call me over the past week and they have each said the same thing, I think. I may have missed one or two of them, didn't say it, but most of them have said, we just love your governor. We're so proud of that guy, and we are in Florida, obviously. Okay, JTN. More than one million people entered U.S. 
illegally in the first six months of 2021, a million people, the number, and guess what? They're all being funneled to Florida. And that's why our COVID rates are going so high, going up through the roof. It's not because of mismanagement by Ron DeSantis. It's because of the federal government. The number of people entering the U.S. illegally who were processed by Border Patrol from January through July of this year totaled more than 1.1 million, enough to create the 10th largest city in the United States and more than the populations of nine states individually. Currently, the 10th largest city is San Jose, California, with a population of 1.3 million. To date, the number is also greater than each of the populations of Wyoming, Vermont, Arkansas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Delaware, Rhode Island, Montana, and the District of Columbia. If the numbers continue at the current rate, those crossing the southern border illegally will total close to the population of the fourth largest city of Houston with a population of 2.3 million all in one year a population greater than 15 states and D.C. These numbers exclude the estimated 30 to 50,000 who reportedly evade capture every month. In July, more than 210,000 came over. In July alone, we are being invaded by our government, not by people from other countries. We're being invaded by our government who is allowing this to happen. Our government is our enemy in this regard. National Pulse, unearthed paper shows Biden-linked group demanding robust audits and admitting machines are hackable even with the, uh, without internet access in 2017. National Pulse, hypocrisy, Pelosi commission demanded election audits warned against altered vote totals from cyber attacks carried out by Chinese Communist Party in 2018. They demanded it and now you can't do that. You're violating people's rights. Just doing an audit. Hypocrisy. Yeah. That's all it is. Left yeah. hypocrisy. Got a less work here for you. We won't know what is false and what's real. Interacting from somewhere else is the deal. Make a virtual space with your glasses on face. Only know what is true by its feel. Okay, who said it? Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. <laughs> Oscar Wilde. Thank goodness, too. Okay. We have a bit of irony here for you. This is a little longer, so I've got to explain it. It's not just a title of irony. Fox News. This is less irony than it is poetic justice. Washington man gets 25 years for murdering sister's rapist after meeting him in jail. A Washington man serving time for a wild police chase found himself sharing a cell with the convicted child rapist who had once victimized his sister. So he killed him. Now he's in jail for the rest of his life, probably. But that's poetic justice. That's right out of the Bible, too. Guess what? That's the Avenger of blood. Such is the world we live in. So from Sarasota, Florida to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, I'm Charlie Garrett, and that is your CG Report for the Week.